Welcome to the next episode of General Relativity. I'm your host, Rifat Bari, Brown University graduate student in physics. Today, we're going to be discussing more about differential forms and why they're covector fields. So remember, in the last lecture, what we talked about is that your good old dx, dy, dr, d theta, they're no longer infinitesimals of variables. No, no, no. They're now covector fields. These good old differentials are now vector fields themselves. Isn't that wild? So let's recap what we did previously. Remember that we had x is some kind of a variable, and the operator d turns x into a small infinitesimal change in x. But in the last lecture, what we discovered is that dx is no longer an infinitesimal change in x. No, dx is actually a vector field. In fact, it's a covector field with an increasing direction that way and an origin somewhere here. And similarly, dy is also a covector field with horizontal contour lines that increase in this direction and has some kind of an origin. So really, what this operator d really does is it takes the scalar field associated with x, and x is negative to the left, 0 in the middle, and positive to the right, the differential operator d takes this scalar field, this is a scalar field, and converts it into a covector field, like this one. This is a covector field. We also call this a zero form, and we call the vector field a one form. And similarly, dy does the exact same thing with the scalar field for y which goes from minus to zero to plus, and the differential operator d converts y into this covector field. We saw the same thing with dr and d theta. We saw that dr, how did that look like? Well, that was made out of contour, but those contours were circles, and those circles increased in this direction. And finally, what did d theta look like? d theta looks like radially increasing lines. So this is what d theta look like, and since theta increased as we went from 0 to 2 pi, this is the direction of increasing acid. So this is dr, and this is d theta. We have completely turned upside down our original conceptions of the infinitesimal variables x, dx, dy, dr, d theta. Now we're going to put these concepts to use and see how do these covector fields transform vectors into scalars. Because remember, the whole idea behind a covector was that it was some kind of a function alpha that was able to convert a vector into a scalar or real number. How did covector fields do that? Well, recall that if you had some kind of a covector field, let's call it alpha, with some kind of an origin and direction of ascent, and there was some kind of a vector in this field, let's say this vector v, all you had to do was count how many contour lines v pierced. So in this case, alpha v would simply be 2 because the vector pierces 1 and 2 control lines. But how do you apply that to these differential fields right here, these covector fields? Let's check that out. Now first recall that these differential covector fields also satisfy the linearity properties associated with regular covectors. In other words, df, our covector field applied to two different vectors, is the same thing as applying our covector field to each of these vectors separately and adding their sum. And likewise, the second linearity property is that of scalar multiplication. So I can just factor out a scalar n and apply my covector field to my vector and still get the same answer. These are just the properties of linearity that we're ordinarily familiar with. But now let me show you something wild. Let's say that we have a covector field as follows. So one of the covector fields we saw last time had this kind of a four quadrant form and it had these kind of circular contour lines but that became more boxy as we went outwards. Now here's a very natural question to ask. We saw that covector fields turn a vector into a scalar. So how does df, when applied to the vector v, turn it into a scalar? In other words, if I have a vector at some point p here, so let's say this is a point p, and I have a vector v here, what is df of v? Let me draw this picture even bigger so you can see what I mean. So let's see how big we can get on the screen. Okay, and let's say that I have 
let's just focus on the first quadrant here. These are the control lines. Let's say we have a point P right here. So this is a point P. And I have some vector V. Okay, so let's say my vector V is like this. What is, the question is, what is, if this is a covector field for DF, what is DF of V equal to? Well, you might just say, wait a second, this vector V, it crosses one, and maybe there's another control line somewhere here. So it crosses one and two control lines. So DF of V should just be two, just like we had with regular old covectors, but not so in this problem because notice that the covector field changes everywhere you go at this point for instance the covector field looks like this at this point the covector field looks like this at this point the covector field looks like this at this point the covector field looks like this so the covector field varies depending on where you are as opposed to our ordinarily uniform covector fields like we had before these covector these Differentials, DF, these differential forms, have different covectors at each, every point. So to alleviate that problem, what we're going to do is focus on this point. Let's zoom in on that point for a second here. So let me erase this, and let's zoom in on that point P. So here is our control line. Here is my point P. And here is my vector V. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the covector field that's tangent at point P. So let's do that now. So these are the covectors that are tangent to point P, tangent to the contour at point P. And now you can just count up how many lines your vector pierces, which in this case is 1, 2, 3, 4. So df of v is actually 4. So Let's take a look at that in another example. Now, let's take a look at another example of differential forms in action. Let's say we have some kind of a contour field, DF. Now, DF can be anything really, but let's say it's one of the fields that we focused on last time. So for example, this is the covector field for DF is equal to DR, right? Because R increases in this direction. So this is the direction of increasing S for the function. Now, let's say I have some point, P. So let's say P is right here. And let's say I have a vector V at this point P. So here's my vector V. To calculate what is DF of V, to calculate what is the differential form DF applied to my vector V, I have to construct the tangent lines to my contour lines at point P. So let's do that. At point P, my tangent lines, my covectors look something like this. So let's stretch them all the way out so I can see how many contour lines my vector pierces. And if I do that, I see that my vector pierces one, two, three contour lines. So df of v is equal to three. That's how we calculate differential forms as if they were actually derivatives. So that's the idea. You can now see why they're called differential forms. Consider another point just for practice. Let's say we pick a point p right here, or a point q since I've already used p. And let's say we have a vector v going in this direction, or a vector w since I've already used v. So to calculate what df of w at point q is equal to, all I have to do is construct the field lines at point q. So the tangent lines at point q look like this. So I see that w pierces basically just one tangent line. So df of w at point q is just one. So there is the idea. Now we ask a simple question. What is the geometrical intuition behind differential forms? To answer that question, I'm going to show you a simple analogy. Let's say we have a mountain, for example, Mount Everest. Mount Everest looks something like this. It has some bumps and valleys, but ultimately you reach the top, the peak of Mount Everest. Now, how can you represent Mount Everest on a 2D map? Well, you use contour lines. And contour lines look something like this. So you have some kind of a wavy outer contour. And this contour represents all the points on the mountain that have the same altitude. So for example, everywhere on this contour, everywhere on this trail might be 300 kilometers. What does that look like on the mountain? Well, this could be some kind of a trail on the mountain 
that everywhere on that trail, it's 300 kilometers above the ground. So that's what contour lines represent. Now, as you get closer and closer to the peak, the contour lines are going to have denser and denser spacing between them. So they're going to get closer and closer and closer until you ultimately reach the peak right there. Now, these contour lines could represent the covector fields for some differential form, df. So the question now is consider some kind of a point on this contour line. Let's say we have a point p right here. And let's say we have a vector. Let's say we have a vector v. Question to the viewer, what is df, our differential covector form, applied to the vector v? Well, we can see that it crosses two lines, you might say. But that's not the question. What we have to do is construct, we have to remember, construct the tangent lines to the contour at point P, at point P, and see how many of those tangent lines our vector V crosses. So in this case, it might be one, two, three, four, five, six. So DF of V might be six. But now here's a question. To understand the geometrical meaning of the differential form, let's say that we have another vector W. W, you might notice, does not go straight up through the, through the mountain. Remember that the differential form is like a directional derivative. And when we go in the direction of the gradient, we're going along the steepest path of the mountain. So W does not go up that steepest path. So new question, what is DF of W? Well, it certainly doesn't cross as many field lines, right? It only crosses, for example, one, two, three, and a half. So I see maybe four contour lines that are trespassed. So df of w is something like 4. So when you don't go up the steepest path, your differential form applied to the vector w is less, right? And similarly, let's say we do go up the steepest path, but let's say I have a vector u, but it's only half the size of v. So df of u only trespasses 1, 2, 3, 4 vectors, 4 contour lines. So again, you can see that the differential form applied to the vector is smaller. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that the differential form, df, when applied to the vector, any arbitrary vector, it's proportional to the steepness of the function f. Steepness, so this differential form is responsive to the steepness of the function at that point, at point p. I really should put df evaluated at point p df evaluated at point P, and df evaluated at point P for all three of these. And second, what does this second example show? It shows that df of v is also proportional to the length, to the length of our vector v, so or arbitrary vector, right? So since df is proportional to the steepness of the function, it's proportional to the length of the function, how can I convey that? Well, I can say if I have, for example, a function that's very steep, something like this, okay? This is one example of a steep function, but one example of a shallow function might be one where the spacing is far apart. Now, if I have two vectors of the same length, notice that these two vectors, and let me just note the direction of increasing ascent, notice that these two vectors pierce wildly different contour lines. This one trespasses through four, this one passes through barely one and a half. Right? So the steepness of the contour lines affects how many contour lines our vector passes through. So the differential form is certainly responsive to the steepness of the function, but it is also responsive to the following. It's also responsive to the length of the vector. So if I have equally spaced out covector lines and I have two vectors that are different sizes, then of course, this one trespasses through two, this one trespasses only one vector, only one control line. So combining these two facts, that the differential form is sensitive to the steepness of the function and how long the vector is, we can conclude. Our conclusion is as follows. Df, df represents, df of the vector v at some point, represents the directional derivative the directional derivative of our function. So that's really what these differential forms are. They're just another way and generalization of the directional derivative. In other words, when I write, for instance, that df of v 
is equal to some scalar at the point P, what I'm really saying is that the directional derivative of my function with respect to the vector v is some scalar. So that's really how, that's really how these covector fields alpha translate a vector v into a real number. They're just directional derivatives. And this is, for example, similar to partial f, partial i, or partial y, or whatnot, some kind of a variable. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the big idea of today's lecture. I hope you enjoyed learning general relativity with me today. We'll see you tomorrow.